Okay. Uh. Ah, this volume's too, too loud. I don't know if you're supposed to be touching yeah. that, Doodles. No, it's okay. Yeah. All right. Hey, how long do this thing starts? Uh, who knows? Who knows? <laughs>
Did you, uh, did, 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 you, did you read the manual? I read the manual, okay, Reggie? Okay. okay. I know what I'm doing. I, I know you do. You do. Of course you do. You're the boss. Oh, boy. Yeah, uh, time, time, time is, uh, racing I toward know. us. There's a sequence to this, okay? <sighs> I have to do that, and then I have to do this. That, then this. Okay, okay. Okay. Well, you did that already, so do you have to do this now? Yes. Hmm. Step by step. <sighs> I'm sorry you're not more patient. Video out to... What? What is SDI? Doodles. One minute. What? Your SBC, take it. Did that dog just say something to you? Something about an SUV. Cancel camp and only give me a few days' notice of this. What? You lied to me, Pepita! Ah! Uh. Oh. Huh. Neat. Five, four, three, two, ah! I saved one. camp! No, you didn't. Yes, I did. Shut up. No, I, I mean, look around. Camp isn't here. This is how we fight our
purpose. So wherever you are today, join me in singing this worship to him. He takes it. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Oh, come on, believe that with me. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn for joining us for Fuge Gathering, a night of worship. My name's Haley, and I'm one of the coordinators for Fuge Camps. This summer obviously looks really different than what we're used to. We miss camp, and we miss getting to be at camp with you guys. But tonight, we have the opportunity to join with churches from all across the country to worship the Lord. God is still working here and around the world. You may know that Fuge partners with the International Mission Board and the North American Mission Board. And so we wanted to still have the opportunity to join together and to give to these missions organizations. You can find the link for more info and a way to give in the description of this video. We may not be together physically, but that won't stop us. We're gonna worship together and we're gonna worship loud, like we're at camp. So whether you are with your youth group or your family, you're alone or you're hanging out with your dog, feel free to stand or sit, kneel, whatever works for you. Most importantly, let's worship together, Fuge. of G. 
What is going on, Fuge? It is so exciting to get a chance to open the word with you guys. We're gonna take a look at how God is working in the midst. We are gonna jump in the word. We're gonna spend some time asking God to show us some things. But again, I am so excited to be with you. It is amazing to have the chance to be able to connect this way even though things look different than they have in the past, and maybe this is the first time you're getting a chance to do something like this, I just wanna say I am so excited because I know that God wants to speak to us right where we are in the midst of our current situation. So before we jump into the word, I just wanna take a minute to pray and to ask God to bless our time. Father, you are so good. And it is because of your goodness and it's because of your mercy that we are full of hope no matter what our circumstances hold. God, I know a lot of us come from different places. We have different stories. We have different circumstances that we're currently in right now, but we come to you right now hungry and thirsty for you to do the thing that only you can do. And that speak to us through your word, and to lead us by your spirit. So we trust you, we love you, and we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. And one of the biggest things that I think every single person knows is that life is a story, and that story is filled with twists, it's filled with turns, it's filled with different moments that maybe we didn't expect. Maybe it's filled with things that are a bit heavy sometimes. There's moments in our story where there's a lot of laughter. There's a lot of good things going on. But story is so important. And every one of us have a different story. And Jesus cared a lot about story as well. As a matter of fact, most of the way that Jesus talked to people was in story form. He spoke in this manner of speaking called parables. I wrote down a definition of a parable. It's a simple story to illustrate or explain a spiritual truth. This is the way that Jesus would talk to people. He would roll up on a crew of folks who were discussing something and he would give them a parable. He would give them a story that would help them to understand what he was trying to communicate. 
And I think story to Jesus wasn't just something that was an effective way of communication, but as a matter of fact, I believe story was used by Jesus so that we could get to the deep essence of really knowing and understanding what he desired for human beings on earth. Story was important. We're going to be in the book of Mark, and it's Mark chapter 4. And in just this chapter, I wrote down that there was a parable about the sower of some seeds. There was a parable about hiding a lamp under a basket. There was a parable about growing seeds. There was a parable about mustard seed. In just this one chapter, there are four parables. And this is such a picture of how Jesus would communicate. He would use these parables to help the watching world understand what it was that he was really trying to communicate. He has this group of followers called the disciples. And the disciples took note that Jesus would always tell these stories. Whenever people would ask a question and Jesus would pull a parable out, the disciples would watch and they would notice how people would respond. And they actually pull him aside. Early in Mark chapter 4, it says that they ask him, why do you speak in parables? What is the deal with your storytelling all the time? And Jesus has an answer for them. He says, sometimes people can see, but they don't perceive. And sometimes they hear, but they don't understand. See, Jesus told stories because he knew that there was a difference between knowing and understanding. That's what I want to focus on in our time in the word together. The difference between knowing and understanding. Because I think this is the very essence of what God wants us to know and understand about himself. We're going to jump into this particular story that might be a little bit familiar to you, whether it's through your reading the Bible in the past, maybe you've heard somebody talk about this idea. I know I have a lot of friends who've never even spent time in church, maybe this is you, but you've heard a story about Jesus calming a storm. That's the story we're gonna look at right now. And when we look at this story, I want us to do so understanding that Jesus was communicating something that I don't think we see on the surface, but hopefully by the end of our time together, we'll be able to live from this picture that he is painting for us, the listener. I want to jump in right here in verse 33 of Mark chapter 4. It says, with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable. But privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. So right here, after him telling all these other parables that I just listed out, it says that he didn't speak to a group of people without dropping some parables on them. But when he was with his little crew, when he was with the disciples, he spoke to them plainly. He spoke to them in a way that they could hear because they understood something a little bit different than everyone else. Well, at least we think that they understand different than everyone else because the story that we're talking about will start to unfold whether or not this is true. It says this in verse 35. On that day when evening had come, he had said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And the other boats were with him. So they are at the Sea of Galilee. Last fall, I was privileged enough to be able to have the chance to take a trip over to the Middle East, and I was staring at the Sea of Galilee. I could not believe the fact that I was actually there. I was filled with wonder looking at this body of water, considering that the story we're about to read happened right in front of me. And the Sea of Galilee quite frankly, 
looks a little bit different than I expected it to. You know, a word like sea kind of seems really, really big, right? A vast sea. Maybe the way that we understand sea is some body of water that you can't even see the end of. But the Sea of Galilee is honestly a lot more like the Lake of Galilee. You can be on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and you can see the other side of the sea. And so being at the Sea of Galilee, you're filled with wonder and awe because you know of the stories that unfolded there. But you're also taking note that this body of water, which is down in this valley of sorts, is kind of contained. So for this to happen, this storm to happen on this body of water, you take note because it's not a large area. And because it's not a large area, if the wind and the waves do anything but stay calm, you would be a little bit afraid. I know I felt that looking at this body of water myself. But look at what it says right after this. In verse 37, it says, A great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. So this is happening right in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. Everything is calm. Everything is good. They are traveling across this sea on a boat together. And then as they're going, all of a sudden, the wind starts kicking up and the waves start crashing and it's starting to get a little bit crazy. And they're looking around and they're seeing the boat start to rock back and forth. And then it says in the text that the water is spilling into the boat. Now, I know that this is a supernatural event. I know this is something that is happening here that is going to carry forward this idea of knowing and understanding. But the other thing that we need to remember is because of where the sea level of the Sea of Galilee was, it was very common for there to be these little windstorms that would stir up and kick up the waters. And so not only was this a common occurrence, but this particular storm seemed a little bit raucous. So the travelers on the boat with Jesus are understandably a little bit afraid. They find themselves in the middle of these circumstances, and now they are starting to panic. Now, I want to pause right here for a second, because I don't know if we know that water in the Middle East, in this time, particularly with the Jewish people, was not perceived as something that was very calming, something that was very welcoming and accommodating. See, in the Jewish people during this time, they viewed water with a little bit of a different spin. For them, water represented chaos. Now, I know that there were some fishermen, and those fishermen were fishermen because of the trade and the necessity for food. But other than fishermen, most of the Jews would have perceived water as something to stay away from. Water was dangerous. Water had power. Water was there to thwart or to stop the things that God wanted to do. So when the water starts kicking up, there is a particular kind of fear that's rising up in these people on the boat. They know that their circumstances are not what they need to be. There is chaos happening and the fear is rising. Now remember, they're experiencing this with Jesus. And Jesus is still on the boat, but he's not panicking. Jesus is doing something completely different. Look at what it says in verse 38. It says, but he was in the stern asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Now this is, So important because the question that the disciples ask Jesus is a question that I think many of us might have uttered over these last few weeks and months that we've spent here in our lifetime. 
Many of us have been asking, just like the disciples, in the midst of a current chaos, in the midst of circumstances that feel like they are uncontrollable, in the midst of crashing wind and waves, in the midst of where it seems like the problems are going to overtake our lives, we might have asked a question just like this. Do you not care that we are perishing? This is such an important thing to see in the Bible. Number one, you need to understand that you're not alone in asking that question. We see that the disciples themselves, the ones who have seen the power of Jesus on display, are with him, and they have the audacity to say to Jesus, do you even care that we're out here dying on this ship? They ask him, do you care? This is a question that I think many of us have wrestled with, and we've honestly felt like, are we even allowed to ask Jesus something like this? It feels sometimes, if we're being honest, like our circumstances are swirling all around us, all the panic is going on around us on social media, everything looks crazy, the news sounds crazy, we go out our doors, it looks crazy, and we start to wonder, God, are you even here? Are you here with us in the midst of our circumstances? Are you here? Do you even care about what's going on? I know that this can feel so real to us and we can feel almost a shame start to come over us when we think about the times where we've asked this question of God. But what I love is how Jesus responds. I love how Jesus moves as a result of what they say to him. Jesus, do you even care? And look at what it says in the text. He awoke and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Do you not care? Not only does he respond with an affirmation that he cares, but the way that he shows that he cares is that he ceases at the very root, the chaos that they find themselves so deathly afraid of. Do you not care? Yes, (laughs) I do. He says, yes, I do. And he does so not with words, but with actions. Now, I talked a little bit earlier about parables, how Jesus would tell stories. And when he would tell stories, he would do so to help people understand what he was talking about. Now, there's a difference between knowing and understanding. We can know things in our head. We can have information that's bouncing around in our noggin. We can have stuff that's contained in our brain. And the knowledge that we have is good and might have a purpose, but knowledge alone does not deal deeply affect our response. When we understand something, that changes the way that we live. What Jesus is always trying to figure out is, do you know who I am or do you understand my power? I think the disciples in this moment were leaning on what they knew about Jesus Where are you? Are you here? Do you even care that we're dying? But what they did not do was understand who he really was. In this moment, Jesus is not telling a parable, but he is living a parable. He wants them not to just know who he is, but understand. Look at the last set of verses. In verse 40, it says, he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear. And he said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, just to close our time together, there are two kinds of fear that show up in these last sets of verses. The first one is the fear that the circumstances that they are experiencing will overtake their lives, that the circumstances will be bigger than their situation, that the circumstances will crush them, that it will break them, that the circumstances will win. There is a fear of their circumstances. There is a fear of the chaos. 
but what they begin to do when they move from knowing the power of Jesus to understanding who he is, is they shift their fear. No longer are they afraid of their circumstances. Now they are afraid of God. Now, you might go, wait a minute. Are we supposed to be afraid of God? Why would I be afraid of God? Well, I'm not talking about afraid, like hide in the corner, don't find me, God, but fear in the way of awe. Awe is this word when you look at something and it is so big, so majestic, so powerful, so beautiful, so wonderful that you cannot even stand in the presence because of how good and how great and how glorious. This is what they're realizing about Jesus. They're moving from knowing to understanding. And I think that this is the question that we have to ask ourselves. Are we stuck in a place where we just know about Jesus? We know the stories about Jesus dying on the cross. We know the stories about the miracles that he's done. We know the stories in our head that we've heard in other people of how God has moved. Do we just know or do we understand deep in our heart that Jesus in all of his power and glory has come not to just be a good example of a great human, not to just come and talk about about God, but Jesus is here as God. He is the God over the chaos, over the circumstances. Jesus is glorious. I just want to close our time in prayer. And as we take this time in prayer, I just want to ask us to, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, just be quiet for a minute and begin to ask ourselves this very question. Do I just know who Jesus is in my head? Or do I understand who Jesus is in my heart? To know is to be stuck in the place where we find ourselves following the track of doing the best that we can in our own effort to be good before God so that he will be pleased with us. But to understand God is to say, I know that it's not my work, it's not who I am, but it's because of who you are that I find life, that I find salvation, that I find rescue. I understand. God, I pray that as we consider for a few minutes the truth of your glory that we see in this text, the truth of your power that we see in this story, I pray that we would consider whether we know or if we understand. <laughs> God, I know that knowing you, knowing about you, knowing of you is important, but you desire that we would understand so that our lives would be changed as a result of your death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. Show us, God, how to take the next right steps forward. Show us how to open our hands and respond to you however you would call us to. God, we trust you and we love you. We thank you for your word and we thank you for the fact that you are working while we are waiting. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen.
Praise the Son, praise the Spirit. The only response that we have is, Lord, we love you, we worship you. And so we want to just sing this quick chorus of a hymn that just says, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost as a response to what He in His great, immense love for us. Out of that love, what He has done for us. So let's sing this together. Praise God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures. He Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Oh, can we do 
that again, Kristen. Sing that. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. What a powerful night of worship. In the midst of the chaos, God is still good. Don't forget to look into how you can pray, give, and go, and get involved with missions organizations both locally and around the world. Thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. This week, you're gonna move into a time of Bible study, recreation, and missions with your churches. And we cannot wait to hear how the Lord is moving in your groups. So we really encourage you to seek what the Lord has for you and to lean in this week. And we'll see you guys at closing celebration.